So let's continue to this now and expand a little bit more uh, on this finding and welcome Professor Richard Walls from the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Stellenbosch. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time, Prof. Let's get your reaction then to the findings of this report. I mean, in the main, it does reveal systemic failures across, you know, building oversight system, doesn't it? I mean, the, the one that also stands out was the fact that the George municipality approved building plans after construction had already started. What for you was of most concern? Um, well, thanks, and uh, thanks for having me on. So, I mean, firstly, it's it's good that information is starting to come to light and that this uh, media statement has been put out. We don't have access to the full NHBRC report. I believe it sounds like it's a 200, 300-page document. We've got the, the sort of short summary. Now, of today, the, the, the minister clearly pointed out that this focuses on the role of the NHBRC in terms of regulatory aspects, inspections, etc. So that, that tells us something in terms of the registration of the contractor, working inspections. However, it doesn't tell us in terms of anything regarding design flaws, materials, etc. There, there's a passing note about materials. So I don't, in, to me, I, I don't think yet this is saying that such and such have failed because we had a failure of the vertical load bearing system, whether it was foundations or columns, et cetera. So, so this won't bring to light whether it was a design flaw or a construction flaw, et cetera. But it does indicate that there were some issues in terms of contractor registration and presentation of, of thing, uh, control by the, the NHBRC inspections, et cetera. I mean, the, the issue of construction starting before um, approval is, is uh, um, attained, unfortunately, that happens very commonly in the country, especially when approvals take, take longer. It shouldn't, but it does happen. And, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's material to the loss. We've got to look at what was actually material to cause the, the, the collapse. Mm. And I mean, uh, also, uh, given the fact that this is a summarized version of that report, I think it's about seven pages out of mm. uh, the many others that we have not seen. Mm. We do, though, understand that uh, several officials have been suspended and that other investigations outside of the Human Settlements Department are currently ongoing. But just to uh, continue to prod uh, and probe perhaps um, some of the, the failures in the NHBRC's inspection and even enrollment processes, I mean, uh, what should have been the steps, do you think, um, you know, just given this scenario that should have been taken here, particularly given the fact that there was also misrepresentation of this particular building itself, including multi-story, et cetera, et cetera. My, as I said, due to the limited information available, yeah. it does seem, though, that potentially the capacity and technical ability of the, of the builders were misrepresented. So it is possible that they didn't have the experience in terms of building multi-story structures. That, that maybe is what they, they are pointing to here. So that may point to the, the lack of technical competency. They also make comments regarding... Um, competency of artisans and other site and technical manager competencies. Once again, I think we will need to wait for the other reports, Department of Labor, South African Police Service, Engineering Council of South Africa, uh, Western Cape Province, etc., to see how many of these contributed indirectly and how many of them contributed directly. Because something ultimately structurally failed, many of these things could have happened and no structural failure would have resulted. They're not, not saying they were good things, uh, they you know, appears to point to uh, various problems on, on this site, but we, they need to see which of those contributed to the, the load carrying capacity being exceeded and then the, the building uh, collapsing. Mm. And perhaps, Prof, let's, let's just talk about um, how important then the municipality's approval roles are in this case and how best, you know, coordination can mm. then happen given just, um, you know, the layers of, of multiple stakeholders that are involved here, including, of course, uh, national departments, coordination thereof. Uh, where do you think, you know, um, the system as it works should be tightened? So one thing, though, is when you do a council approval, one thing we need to know what actually failed first, so what brought down the building. And councils don't check design calculations. They don't check member sizes. They check general layouts and parking sizes and fire safety and various other things. But they don't do a third-party review. So if it was a structural failure due to something having been under-designed, 
The municipality could not have been expected to, to identify that. Also, if it was poor quality materials, they weren't there to do the inspection. So yes, the municipality is important and um, approval pro uh, processes are important, but it may or may not be related to what actually brought down the building. So good quality approval um, processes really do help and are, are important, but you can have a building which is incorrectly designed or incorrectly constructed where every T is crossed and I is dotted in your approval authority. So often that you'll need multiple levels of quality control. The, the council approval plus quality engineers, plus quality contractors, plus you know, inspections, et cetera, all those things together help resolve these sorts of things. So it's, it's very difficult to put all of this on the municipality, um, even if certain things are identified. And very quickly, Prof, as we wrap up our conversation, in terms of the Housing Consumer Protection Act and just some of the enforcement tools that are in place, I mean, do you think that stricter uh, enforcement, uh, you know, tools should be in, in place, in, including uh, increasing the penalty? I mean, some uh, speak of penalties that could amount to around 1.5 million rand, et cetera, et cetera. But where do you think, from an accountability perspective, you know, the improvements should lie there? There are a lot of things, and it depends once again on who the, the, the subsequent reports find is at fault. So if it is contractors acting outside of their capabilities, then yes, some of the things you've mentioned are, are good in terms of keep, um, holding people responsible who are not acting ethically, being able to report people to be able to check the competency and capacity of contractors to improve those, those metrics. If it is a design flaw, then it's more on the Engineering Council of South Africa uh, perspective, you know, looking at, at where things lie and how do we know people are competent and if there are complaints against person, how are they followed up? If it's quality controls, then it's also looking at the, the paperwork, the process flow, material testing. There's a range of things. So there's, there's never one thing. It's always a range of aspects that can be tightened up on. A lot of it is really in place. It's just whether it is actually carried through and, and done on a construction site is normally the bigger issue. All right, Professor Walls, let's leave it there for now. Thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm. Professor Richard Walls from the Department of Civil Engineering at Stellenbosch University, of course, responding there uh, to that uh, report uh, by Minister of Human Settlements, Tembi Simulani, uh, also revealing a number of factors, including the George Municipality approved uh, building plans while construction was already underway. Several uh, officials have now been uh, suspended. Several investigations are also taking place. You will, of course, recall that 30 Four people lost their lives during that building collapse in George in the Western Cape.